Hello guys, we are in João's workshop in Santarém. Thank you for doing this, man. Man, thank you for having me. <laughs> we, are, we have been riding together for years, we are best friends for years. You may have known him in previous videos that I've done. This year, however, John did something very special. He was invited to go to the Dakar Rally, working as a mechanic for Team Bianchi Prata. And on his team, he had uh, two CRFs 450 and one KTM 450. Yeah. Uh, and you were one of the three mechanics, right? Yeah. How did this happen? How did this? How did you end up in Saudi Arabia? Uh, well, that, that's a very good question because not even me, I'm sure about uh, how this came to be. Because Pedro had a lot of mechanics, a lot of people who who he could choose. I basically did try to do my best and to do everything according to his uh, his standards. And he liked my work. We focused on training me. Uh, in the past uh, championship here in Portugal. I was more of a, a trail bike mechanic and uh, he basically trained me as a racing mechanic. It's, mm. a, it's a completely different type of, of mechanic that you need to do. So I think it was that. I think it was hard just work, uh, hard work, effort and never give up. There you go. Uh, why are there so many KTMs racing the Dakar and only a few of Honda, Suzuki's, Kawasaki's and so yeah. on? Before you answer, remember that that's the internet right there and things get really emotional and personal really fast. So say what you must, but don't offend anyone's religion. Yeah. Hello, internet. <laughs> because he's orange inside. And, uh, yeah, but it is what it is. Y you could see like 80% KTMs and 20% of other brands. But why? Why? That's the thing. In my experience, I've worked with uh, both bikes, uh, with both brands, Honda and KTM. And here at my service shop, I work with every brand. And what I see as a mechanic is a much more prepared motorcycle than the rest. KTMs mm. um, are produced by a brand that only focuses on producing motorcycles. And the Dakar is one of their holy grails. It's a... Uh, 18 years of consecutive wins, it's not something you can get out of the blue. We also had the chance to test the oils that we took from the bikes, uh, from each maintenance on the Moltool labs, and we could see a big difference, mm. yeah, uh, between the KTM oil and the Honda oil. From KTM, you can also extract more horsepower, more RPM with an engine that's prepared Stays. for that. What about working on the bike? Is it easier, like less screws, less, you know, yeah. labor around the bike? Um, there's a, a saying amongst people that uh, KTMs are built by mechanics for mechanics. Mm. Uh, for instance, if you need to uh, take off a rear shock from a Honda or a Yamaha, you have to disassemble practically half a bike. You the subframe and all that. Subframe, airbox, airbox yeah. everything. And on a KTM, you just take the, the shock screws and take the shock out. Right. Yeah. Guys, we are not sponsored by KTM. He would like to be sponsored. Uh, he you is orange inside. Have to. So we have here some questions from the subscribers. The first one is from João P.N. Marques. He asks, you like this one, how is the typical day of the Dakar mechanic? Okay. Um, so basically we wake up at night, we wake up like 5, 5.30 or something, usually. While the, the riders are waking up, getting ready and everything, we are disassembling and packing everything up to go to the next bivouac. And uh, the only thing that stays out, it's the, the place for them to suit up. As soon as they arrive, they start suiting up. We mechanics, we go uh, for a final check on the bike. We see if the navigation is, uh, if everything is working well, because during the night with very cold temperatures, anything can happen yeah. on the morning. You, you can just find something stuck or the road, road book not working or something. Uh, in the morning when you leave, like the, the riders, they go to the, the, the liaison, mm -hmm. you guys follow them if you can keep up yeah. with them, I guess. Yeah, exactly. In my case, I would go on a van that um, takes a press team to, to the track and I was there just in case uh, anything happened. So I spent my day near the track in case any of our riders needed help or needed anything. But it would be against the rules? Do you get penalized? Yes, the uh, rider is penalized, but... Okay. Uh, but Better than asking for the helicopter or whatever. And sometimes they don't know you got help, I guess. 
Like, I mean, it's, you are in the middle of the desert. That's difficult because all the vehicles are tracked and ah, have yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the sure, GPS sure. on the vehicle. So it's very difficult for, for nice, that to happen. Nice. And if you sense. take the GPS off your vehicle, it starts warning because it's not connected to the vehicle. I have footage to show that. Uh, we go to the bivouac with the riders. Usually they get there faster, a little bit faster than us. As soon as I get there, the bike is there. My um, paddock is all set up because of the other guys that went on the truck to the next bivouac. They set up all the paddock. I arrive, I have my tools ready, my, uh, my rider's motorcycle also waiting for me. And uh, for myself, I try to go eat something before I start to freshen up, to do whatever I need. So when I start the bike, I only stop when I finish it. Our riders usually arrived between five, it, which would be a very good day that mm -hmm. everything went well, they didn't waste time or anything, and eight, okay. more or less. Jesus, okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Uh, some, some days are shorter than others, like the stage is shorter, whatever, those days like usually, I mean, they arrive earlier to the bivouac, but those are the yeah. exceptions, I guess. Yeah, those are the exceptions. But for example, on those days, we take the time, we take the extra time we have to do extra work. Extra work, okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. What time usually can you go have dinner, you know, sleep, uh, you know, averagely? I know that some days are more difficult than <laughs> others. If you had dinner, you were on a lucky day. You okay. Know? <laughs> <laughs> so you usually have snacks on the... Yeah. yeah. When we arrive, uh, I usually already have eaten something on the van. And when I arrive, I just eat a ration, which is basically like pasta or something. You get that we, from the canteen. Yeah. So you can go there and pick snacks whenever, but meals yeah. only when possible. We okay. usually had like just a small meal, just something for you not to be hungry. And uh, we would have dinner either in the middle of work if it was taking a really long time because we would work more or less between five to eight hours per day on each bike if everything went well and we did it fast like at 11 midnight or something no. we would go <laughs> have dinner oh. yeah okay so we could um, so we could finish our work more comfortably and then go to bed not being hungry you mentioned many times that the food was really good in the canteen, yeah. but it was like uh, Arabic food, right? Mostly like, uh, no? Yes, it, it all... Exotic. No, always had a, a touch of Arabic, you know, but... Um, you I'm know. asking this because you were very, like John was saying that the canteen was great, like everything was very good, but then other people that are not used to yeah. foreign yes. food, like yes, they were, yes, oh, yes. you know, they would like to have a steak with fries. And they were giving something else. So that, that's why I'm asking, was it like a more local food, you yes, know, inspired course. by the local yes, of spices course. and of course. whatever? Of course, the, the catering company is Arabic. So for, for someone to start liking those kinds of food, Arabic foods and everything well seasoned and yeah. uh, strong foods, I think that was the best catering I've ever seen because it was not that strong. They, mm. they, they had that in mind that yeah, some people... Spicy, but not Yeah, Indian. not very spicy, yeah. not those, those kinds of dishes they, they do for themselves. Mm. They, they soften uh, the thing yeah. a little bit. Yeah. All right. Our common friend Tito, Red Raven, that has a project called ADV Head, he asked me uh, to ask you, like, how hard it is to move every day when the bivouac changes from this bivouac to the next bivouac, like, how hard it is to disassemble the pits, get everything ready, the whole bivouac itself, yeah. like, to, to move to another town, how hard, how, how long does it take to do that? It's, it's, that's the hardest, I think that's the hardest thing of the Dakar. Whenever we had to change the bivouacs, those, those were the hardest days because besides the work, the work we had to do on the bikes, we had to assemble the bivouac, uh, our paddock in the bivouac before we started working. As soon as we stop working, we disassemble everything again. So the next day we go to the next bivouac. Yeah. How and long does it take more or less to disassemble your pit? Uh, I think uh, one hour, oh. one hour and a half. Um, three guys helping or four? No, five or six. Everyone, riders, yeah. even the mechanics. riders. If they are, if they are already there, yeah. if they are available, they will, they, they will help. Yeah. Because uh, they they try to take some extra work from off of us. What about the bivouac itself? The organization, as you know, taking everything to the next. Um, I believe uh, for them to assemble a whole bivouac, it's about two days mm. because they had uh, three bivouacs uh, oh, working okay. all, all the time. When we moved 
to a bivouac. Yeah. There were there was already another bivouac being set up for the day okay. uh, after. So it's not the no. same building. It's yeah. they are two or three buildings that are you know. Open. There are three sets of bivouacs. Yeah. I think most people don't yeah. know this that they they have two or three sets of bivouacs. That, yeah. you know they they keep, keep yeah. moving. Okay, uh, very interesting. Thank you. Next question from. Oleg Leskiv, sorry if I just assassinated your name, man. Uh, he wants to know what tools and spare parts do the riders have on their motorcycles? Yeah, um, they didn't take much spare parts. Uh, they took a couple levers that, that were behind this plastic, uh, a little bit of chain and two chain locks, uh, two clutch discs, one metallic and one non-metallic okay. here on the front. Why not the complete... Clutch this. It was too much weight, mm -hmm. and uh, you wouldn't wouldn't need to take it because if the clutch for some reason collapses or stops working or anything, they can try and and change only one of the discs or add a disc. Add the disc. Add the disc to the the. Um, so, what you mean is that like while the clutch discs get weared out, they yeah. become smaller, so exactly. you can actually fit an, another set of discs. It like doesn't another... get as well fitted as it is but without the extra disc, but it, it is possible to, to You either replace it. one or you actually add the new Yeah, one. you yeah. can choose one or uh, the two options. If it's really, really damaged, yeah, you just add the disc and take it easy to the finish line. Right. Yeah. You mentioned levers, so clutch and brake levers. Do you guys use those ones that flip up, that have like a no, bendy no, thingy? No, no, Why not? Because be those cannot be broken. I mean, that's the that's the legend. Yeah. They, they don't break. Yes, but uh, the problem is that uh, they aren't uh, precisely machined as the original ones are, mm. and the fitting is not perfect. And if it's not perfect, the cable doesn't work as well, or the hydraulic clutch. So not even the big teams use those ones. No, like they no. could because they could machine, you know, something. No one it's uses a, that. It's all all ori original levers. Right. Yeah. So I interrupted the question. So you're telling me about the spare parts and the tools that they carry. Yeah. Uh, so basically, those are the, the parts and uh, a spark plug. Yeah, oh, okay. and the spark plug. And then they had like a small toolkit on the saddlebag. Mm -hmm. Well, but, what, one kilo maybe? Yeah, not even as much, okay. not even as okay. much. Uh, with just the uh, basic tools for disassembling the bike, it, it doesn't require a lot of tools. So. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you guys use mousses on the tires, yeah. so no flat tires. Uh, any problem with the mousses? Uh, we didn't have uh, any problems because Pedro decided to change the mousses every two days. Okay. So just to guarantee that they it, would not fall apart. Yes, exactly. There were riders that used two mooses for the whole Dakar That's because the, the, the desert mooses are really, really good and they can hang it. Any special tool? Like you mentioned a small, normal toolkit. Anything that you only saw on the Dakar or like a trick that they use that we never thought about? Uh, you know, for the roadbook, they have to put the... Um, they, they have to roll up the mm -hmm. roadbook inside. Yeah. They have to tape the yeah. beginning yeah. and the end. Yeah. So everyone, but everyone on the Dakar, Wherever you can find like a tool like this on the bike here, or even the brake hoses, yeah. which was the most common one, ah. they would put a small roll and they would roll tape. Okay, on that roll. just tape there, yeah. Yeah, so you had a, a roll on, on the so bike. you could take little pieces yeah. of tape. Okay, yeah. funny, interesting. Okay, next question is from Boris Diwar. Diwar, D they were, sorry man, Diwar. Uh, he asks, uh, what was the most noble thing that you witnessed? And he also asked, what was the, the meanest thing that you witnessed? What we got to see was very, very little. We were always, always focused on what we had to do. If we're not working, we're trying to get some rest, we're trying to get food, we're trying to take a bath or something. And the most noble thing I saw uh, was actually in our team when the KTM got uh, got the engine ruined. On the last stages. On, yeah. on the before last yeah. stage. Um, the KTM stopped, uh, the engine wasn't starting, so our rider had to stay on the track. The organization had to take him out of there. We got the KTM around midnight or something. We were already working on the Hondas for like two hours or something. So we finished the Hondas at 3, 4 a.m. more or less. Jesus. And the KTM, KTM mechanic was still on the bike trying to fix the problem. The bike had a lot of issues because um, it overheated a lot. Uh, not just on that day, the days before it all also overheated. 
Um, so we had to repair a lot of problems. I didn't get any sleep. We worked the whole night, checked the compression and the engine was out of compression. And the thing was, it was time for the rider to go. So basically we trailered the bike to a van. Mm -hmm. We pushed the van, uh, we pushed the bike with the van to start it. Okay, jump start it. Yeah, basically to jump start it. And um, we, we gave the bike to the rider. The rider went to the starting line just to, to mark his timing. He came back and the whole team gathered around to help us, to help the mechanics for, them, for themselves to help us to change the engine. Um, as quickly as possible so our rider could uh, could finish the Dakar and could do the last stages. The, the worst thing I saw was actually a team started fighting each other. It was like 3 a.m. or something, everyone was working and everyone is exhausted, everyone has their, their everyone edge. is nervous. On edge. Yeah, and uh, they all of a sudden start fighting each other, uh, then they got separated and I don't actually know Actually fighting, happened. like... Actually <laughs> fighting, okay, nice. hurting each other. <laughs> Proper uh, fighting. I don't. I, I don't know what happened, but yeah, yeah. that wasn't a cool thing. But that cannot happen. You're the, you, there's a lot of money invested, so you can mm. you can't take a chance you like that. Need to swallow your ego and do what you yeah, have to. You just yeah. have to do what you have to do. Right. right. That's it. Uh, I have to follow through because, like, uh, we were talking about how, how reliable the KTM's are, and yeah. now the KTM was the one having the problem. Yeah. Uh, can you explain why that happened, or yeah, is sure. there an explanation? Sure. Yeah, th there is because uh, the air filter failed. Uh, we had a lot of uh, some dust passing the air filter uh, it, it wasn't just on that day it already had happened on the other days uh, it was a new filters uh, they were testing um, and the rider that took that bike which is a factory rally bike uh, from Paulo KTM, Oliveira right yeah, yeah. Paulo Oliveira uh, he, he isn't a very very fast rider and that's a factory machine factory machines are prepared to go full gas if if you don't have that that speed to go through dunes, through fesh fesh or silt, if you take it a little bit slower, it's bad for the bike because the bike will overheat very easily. Can yeah. you explain what is fesh fesh or silt? The two names. Yeah, fesh fesh or silt is it's considered the type of sand, but it's it's so weared out. It's like flour. It's just like brown Powder, flour basically. powder. If it, it, it's unanimous that there's no technique for silt, just grab onto the to the throttle yeah. and, and let's go through it. Like you don't yeah. ride over silt. Like when you go into a silt pit, like mm. the bike goes into the pit. You have sand like all over you. It's not like you're mm. riding on it. You're riding through it. Yeah. And it's a terrible thing for the air filters and everything, I guess. Yeah. Electronic parts even because that everything that is moist will soak up exactly. the, the powder and whatever. Yeah, that was one of the problems of the bike. Yeah. The relays, yeah. they were they were isolated with the grease, mm -hmm. and the grease started to become uh, concrete. Yeah, basically. there was a lot, a lot of dirt yeah. in everything. Every plug, every relay had dirt on that bike because he fell a lot on the fesh fesh. He revved the engine a lot to try and get out of it, and that's what killed the engine. Okay. Yeah. It's Shan Morin and uh, Dan B. They ask. How do the riders and the drivers relieve themselves during the stage? Like, how do they peace? And they yeah, <laughs> I don't know because I wasn't in the stage. The only thing I know is that every morning, besides the motorcycle that we had to prepare for our riders, we had to pack up like a little bit of paper, you know, a little bit of toilet paper for yeah. them to take with themselves mm -hmm. for the beginning of the stage. So, so right before they yeah, begin, right they go before they the... begin, they go ah, okay. do their thing, and then I I think they they only try they only go to the bathroom when uh, when it's a refueling point or any so stop because when they refuel like the the time the the, the time stops like they are not counting yeah. their time for like twenty minutes you can yeah. refuel. If you went to a refueling point, whenever we reach the refueling point, uh, there would be like hundreds of guys pissing yeah, <laughs> in yeah, yeah. every direction, okay. once to the wheels of the car, one everywhere. <laughs> you could see that was the bathroom. Okay, okay. <laughs> also, okay. The, I think the bathroom that, break. That answers the question, I think. Okay, then B has another question. This time it's a, it's a weird question. He asks if the mechanics get paid to be in the Dakar or if they pay I guess to have the honor to be there. 
No, no, we are, we are paid to go because uh, uh, it's a lot of days out, it's a lot of hard work. The least you can have is being paid, yeah? I guess. Uh, it's the top of the career, which yeah. means you, I guess you need to be paid more. <laughs> I guess it's a weird question then, I, I don't know. He actually has another question, then B, which is uh, how much preparation goes into a Dakar bike? So you guys buy the Enduro models, I guess, mm -hmm. and then what kind of modifications do you have to do in order to race the Dakar? Okay. Um... If you ask me what is my opinion, my personal opinion uh, as a mechanic, uh, of what it should be uh, uh, done on a bike before the Dakar, it's a little bit different of what we did. Uh, because this was Pedro's setup, he decided uh, the preparation we would do to the bikes. And basically, on a, uh, an engine and reliability matter, we didn't do anything. We had a, an original bike, brand new CRF uh, 450 of 2022, and we accepted it as, as it was. Just yeah. a different oil. We used the best oil we could find, um, and that's about it. Other than that, we had to put more gasoline on the bike. We had two uh, tanks uh, on the low part, one t the main tank above and another one on the rear. We also upgraded suspensions. We did a full preparation of the front and back suspension. Same suspension, but yeah. revolved then. Exactly, okay. exactly. Uh, and the nav navigation, also very important. The navigation tower with uh, oh, yes, all the antennas, all the GPSs and everything and uh, try to improve a little bit of comfort. Just uh, modify the seat a little bit and uh, some extra soft um, grips. And uh, that was basically it. So guys, I think we are wasting too much money on upgrades considering this is what you need to do, you know, bare minimum to do the Dakar, fuel tanks and... Yeah. Okay. If you ask me, I don't agree with that. You okay. should try, if you're investing that, that amount of money on doing a Dakar, which is a huge investment, mm. you should take a big part of that investment and put it on the bike. Because yeah. you can do it with a stock bike, mm. but it will make your life a living hell. We did extra work every day, so we made sure nothing okay, went wrong. Okay. We revisioned everything, every single thing on the bike every single day. We had three or four more extra hours of work than the KTM mechanic sure. just because we didn't have the bike so well prepared. It's just about the amount of work you're going to have in the of end course, of the of day. Course. What other small things could be done on the bike to make it more reliable, you know, hold the stress a little bit more? Uh, for example, uh, you have to rebuild the top end of the engine, much more reliable piston and camshaft, just to make sure nothing, no problem comes out of there. Uh, a spark plug suited for higher temperatures, mm -hmm. an oil radiator, maybe a reinforced clutch uh, and uh, a little bit of extra cooling for the coolant of the okay. engine and also extra venting of the engine. Try to select. Temperature is the big problem. Yeah, temperature is a big problem. And More air filters, like pre-filters, extra no, no, filters, no, 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 those work perfectly and the bikes are sensible to that. If mm. you if you put a, a pre-filter or extra filters for the admission, the bike will sense that and won't work as well. What about the bikes from the factory teams? Let's say the Honda factory, Honda bikes. Like. Uh, were they very different from yours, like a lot more investment or basically the same? No, they, they are completely different and there is a lot more investment. We knew that, for example, RS Moto, uh, which is another, uh, another Honda racing team, um, were working with, uh, f I think they had like three or four fuel pumps in the bike just for the gasoline. Mm. Uh, redundancy, like if one fails, you have... Yes, a, okay. redundancy and one for each tank. So uh, we used a vacuum system, which was a little bit simpler. I don't know. There were big differences. And of course, there is a big difference in investment on the other course. Teams. Yeah, because they, they completely modified the... Yeah. Uh, Suspensions, probably. Yeah, new engine. Ones. They had more horsepower coming okay. out of the engine. Yeah, a lot of things are mm -hmm. different. But I can't point out exactly what okay. were the differences.
Okay, this question is from Cambag77, one of my yeah. most dear subscribers. <laughs> he asks if the um, low budget teams, like yours kind of was, look at the top budget teams with envy, if there's like this rivalry when you think, okay, these guys have everything is easy for them, you know, good bike, lots of mechanics. Like, is there a rivalry or do you guys just do your own thing? Ah, uh, no. No absolute uh, feeling like that. Everyone is suffering with something, and even the, the top racing teams, they, they sometimes had to work as late as us. Sometimes we would go to bed earlier than them because they had a lot more work. I don't know, I, it, it was just a sense of uh, co-working. Everyone is focused on the same task. No but one. There's no pay to win in that. Yeah, part, no, yeah. no. The, there's basically a lot of focus. Everyone is focused on their own task, mm. and uh, everyone becomes neighbors. We had uh, top riders coming to our to our uh, paddock to see what we were doing, to say hi. Uh, we had uh, top mechanics, and everyone helps each other. Everyone is there for the same thing, and you, you did. I didn't feel anything like that. Yeah, and I didn't feel any of my colleagues or anyone around me was uh, thinking about that or commenting mm -hmm. even something okay. related to it. Okay, there you go, come back. Yeah. Okay, then now Kula Sand, he asks, how does the hero compare to the KTM or Honda? Do you know anything about that? I know we have a Portuguese rider on them. J-Rod, yeah. Two Portuguese riders, we also and have Buller. Sebastian Buller. But uh, I can't tell you anything about it because I don't know the bikes and uh, I haven't been with one and uh, in the Dakar, a lot less. Right, the next question from Vando Ribas. Vando wants to know what's the total cost of racing the Dakar as a Moto Malé? I don't know. That, that's, uh, the thing is that I actually spent the whole 20 days only focused solely on mechanics. What I can tell you is that there was a, a team with uh, with the factory rally replicas, uh, KTM's, okay. uh, that had a service w which you pay, I think it's 70,000 euros, okay. and you have the full service for Dakar. You just have to take your keys and your uh, wallet, wallet and, just go. and just enjoy the Dakar with a professional mechanic team, with a place to sleep, everything. Is it more like, do you think, I mean, I, don't, I, I know you don't know this for sure, but is it, is it uh, cheaper to go on that team, pay 70,000 and do the Dakar, or to take your own bike as a Moto Malé, do your own mechanics? Do you think that's cheaper option or more expensive? I don't know, because when you go with a, with a uh, service like that, there are a lot of costs that are diluted by all of the riders, riders, all yeah. of the 20 riders. So I don't know if you had to send your own bike, just you pay a container just for your own bike for yeah. yourself to Dakar and yeah. from Dakar and all of the logistics involved. I don't know if it's uh, if it's cheaper or not. It sounds like even if it's cheaper, it, it might as well just pay the seventy thousand and you know j just race. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. we don't know about what you asked, Vandu, but seventy thousand gets you there with no. I mean, with their motorcycle, with everything. So it sounds like a reasonable yeah. deal, I guess. Last question from a subscriber is uh, Bruno Borges. He has a shameless question. He asks, "What about the girls? We want we want to know about the the, the Arabic girls." <laughs> the Arabic, from what I saw, which was very very little, they always had pretty eyes, very pretty eyes, but you couldn't see anything ah, else. Yeah, they had the burkas, but behind the burkas, the eyes were very pretty. Okay, and there was they were always <laughs> very nice. So. Basically, that's what I did. Saw. You see a lot of locals, or did you live like yeah. inside the Dakar, Dakar no, bubble? Yeah. Oh, we okay. also had locals in the in the organization, ah, of course. on the medical teams, on the cafeteria, everywhere. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we had to go to the cities a lot. We had to go to the gas stations. Sometimes we ate uh, something on the road, on a restaurant, or something. Uh, sometimes we had to go for gasoline or, or or diesel. So we were always involved with the locals. Yeah. Okay. Okay, John, so now I have some questions of my own. Uh, the first is, if you were in charge, if you were the king of the Dakar, what would be the first thing you'd change? Mm, uh, I think I'm not even entitled to answer that because 
what we saw of the Azo Logistics, which is the company that uh, organizes the Dakar, was the most incredible work of logistics I've ever seen. You had a, a huge, huge paddock for three, more than 3,000 people. When you get to the bivouac, everything is perfectly uh, functional, everything is working, you, you have hot water for a bath every time of the day, have food every time of the day. Even when they, they cancelled one of the bivouacs because, mm -hmm. uh, because of the floods, the floods uh, we expected that the next bivouac would be a little bit uh, less prepared or that there would be some problem there. But no, everything was perfectly set up. It was incredible to see the, the work they did. Yeah, I, I can't point out something I would like to see better. Yeah. Okay, next question. Uh, what surprised you? So what things did you thought they were going to be very hard and turn out to be easy? What things you thought it was going to be easy and turn out to be hard? To be honest, the only thing that surprised me was the food. Okay. <laughs> the food was really, really good. I, 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 didn't, I didn't even think I would be able to eat that much, uh, let alone such good food. So that was that, what most surprised me. Uh, but to be honest, I, I've, I've been around, I've, I've been working in the national and international championships for seven years. Uh, I've done some expeditions to Africa. Um, so I'm used to this, to this, these environment, environments yeah. and uh, it was what I expected. Uh, the only thing that wasn't what I expected was my, my own feelings. I, I, I was expecting to get to the Dakar, fulfilling a dream and I don't know, shed a tear or, yeah, yeah. or just be really happy or something. But for us mechanics and staff, uh, it was <laughs> just another race. There was a starting line, there's the bivouac, there's the tools, there's the bike, I have to do this, do that. and Same, but every day during 15 and days. A lot of times I, I, I asked myself, man, you're in the Dakar, where's the excitement? Wake up, man. <laughs> where's that feeling yeah. of fulfilling this dream? And I looked around and I was like, fuck, everyone is working, it's just work, tools. Oh, there's a flag of Dakar. Yeah, good, I'm in the Dakar. Just yeah. start working. And acknowledge yeah. to yourself, keep, keep that yeah, in mind. Well, that, that, that's about it, yeah. Okay, very experienced man. Hard training, easy fights. Yeah. Okay, so I think I have one last question. Next year, do you want to go back? <laughs> I would go back. Um, but uh, I don't know if in the same team, just for a personal progress matter, you know, uh, of, of my career, because uh, I'm starting my own project and now it's time to focus on, on myself a you little mean bit this more. this workshop? Yeah, okay. on, on this workshop. Um, but I would, I would with, uh, I don't know, probably, I, I can't tell you. Open for negotiation. Open for negotiation, yeah. But uh, the feeling I brought from there was that um, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> and been there, done that. Yeah, and I've done this sometimes in my life and this exhausts you. It, 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 there's a little bit of you that stays there, you uh -huh. know, that dies there. Mm. So... Uh, it will it will have to be well thought if there will be more Dakars or no. Okay, maybe yeah. with a team with better conditions, you know, a place to sleep yeah. out of, you know, not a tent, maybe. That, you know that 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 was all a little bit part of it. It was yeah, yeah, sure. uh, it, it was kind of fun. Sure. Uh, one one thing I keep reminding myself was when we set up the tents. Uh, we had to be careful where, where would set up the tent mm. because you could be, be run over by a Kamaz during the night. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Kamaz were, were passing by like one meter away from my tent. Uh -huh. And you were like, and th that was part of the feeling, you know? Uh -huh. uh, if, if, uh, uh, if my first Dakar experience would have been in a motorhome with uh, personal cuisine and yeah. personal shower and everything, I don't know. I think, it would have, uh, th th there would yeah. have been something missing in the whole experience. For sure, for sure. Yeah, so, I don't know, I'm just open for negotiation for next year. Would you like to race the Dakar one day? Like, let's say someone, dude, 
take a bike, be on mm. our team, someone will take care of the mechanics. It's not a dream of mine. Mm. It's not a dream of mine. I would brace it, definitely. Uh, not waste the opportunity. Yeah, not waste the opportunity. I would never do that. But uh, I'm, I'm not a racer. I'm a mechanic. And racing has things I can't deal with. Uh, it's very dangerous. Uh, and for me as a mechanic, I need my whole body perfectly fit to work. So that's the thing I can't take out of my mind. And um, I don't know, you, you see, there are a lot of dangers. And basically, that's the, the biggest reason for, for me not to have that dream of racing the Dakar. It's a bigger dream for me to be a part of it as a mechanic than as a racer. Crazy. So, One yeah. born every minute. Yeah. OK, I think we are done. Thank yeah. you for doing this, man. It was oh, a man. pleasure. Yeah, uh, me too. I hope we answered the questions you wanted to hear. If not, please write down in the comments. If there are enough questions, maybe we do this somewhere in the future. Stay tuned for part two. Maybe. <laughs> As usual, if you found this useful or entertaining, please don't forget to like, to subscribe, to hit the thingy and to share. Share this video with someone who enjoys the Dakar and has one hour or 30 minutes or whatever to listen to an interview and maybe he will be, you know, grateful. See you next week and happy rides. See you guys. Nice, very nice, my friend. Mm -hmm.